Enough from us. Let's bring in Coach Rockwood, our second guest tonight, the only head coach in the successful history of women's soccer at BYU. Been at the helm since 1995, number 12 all time, with 435 Division I victories. Her 75.1% winning percentage is eighth best among active coaches. Seven times she's been voted as Conference Coach of the Year, and for the first time she's leading the Cougars into the Big 12. A pleasure to welcome back to the show Coach Jen Rockwood. Did I read that exactly as you wrote it? Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Been around so long, I don't know what they say anymore. <laughs> it's good to have you back. Yeah, well, thanks so for much has me. happened since our last visit. Yeah, and and now you've got your schedule, which we want to talk about. And practice starts next Tuesday for your twenty eighth season. How has the evo- what, what how, how do we say it the um, the elevation to a P five program changed things for for your squad? Um, to be honest, I don't know that a whole lot's changed. Right. We've, we've tried to be a nationally competitive program, you know, ever since we started the program uh, 29 years ago, well, 28 years ago. And, and so, I, you know, we're obviously very excited about the move uh, into the new conference and I know how great it is for uh, BYU athletics overall, particularly yeah. for football. And, you know, anything that helps football helps all of uh, our, us other Olympic sports. And yeah. so we're very excited about that. But, um, you know, I, I think it's just something that's going to be new for us, a new challenge. Um, but I don't think we've really done anything too different. Um, you know, we'll have to watch a lot more film as we get closer yeah. to conference play and uh, not being as familiar with, uh, you know, the Big 12 schools. But other than that, you know, we, we've, we're kind of just moving along like we've always moved. And the girls have been working hard this summer and really excited to start next week. I know the last four years are a concern. Uh, 2019, the Elite Eight. 2020, the second round. 2021, the national championship game. Hmm. 2022, the Sweet 16. Um, yeah, it's this way. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've talked about it for a long time. Yeah. That soccer's been Big 12 ready long before the Big 12 invited. Uh, the preseason coaches poll, media poll hasn't come out yet as mm-hmm. far as we know. But we expect BYU to be picked number one, if not number uh-huh. one with TCU as a close two, right? Yeah, I mean, we, we would hope we're prepared. I mean, that's right. what we, we're doing. We're, we're always preparing every year. And uh, this will be our fourth conference. And, um, you know, there's always a learning curve uh, going into a conference, especially a, a P5 conference which, you know, we've never done before. But, um, you know, we, we hope that we're P5 ready, for sure. I mean, we plan on that. Uh, we have really high expectations. And, uh, you know, it, I don't know where they'll put us, uh, but we have a lot of returning players. Yeah. And uh, so we expect to be pretty good next year. And uh, really ne- Hey, next to year, it. next week. Next week, <laughs> yes. It comes fast. Yeah. Um, you know, when it comes to this being your, your fourth, you know, new conference, um, is there things that you can take away from going into – you know, the other new conferences previously, or is it got to be a a situation, like case-by-case situation? I I think it's going to be case-by-case. I think it will be... um um, weekend by weekend. One of the things that we're going to face this uh, season that'll be new is the logistics of the travel. Mm. You know, everyone's going to be traveling a little bit more, but um, I think for us, we uh, sun, uh, Sunday, soccer's a Sunday sport, right? Uh, across the country yeah. in college, in women's college. And so, oh, I didn't know that. yeah, we're going to be playing Thursday, Monday. And so that's a really challenging schedule considering five of our games uh, in conference will be on Mondays. Um, and won't have a practice won't have day. Won't have a practice day right. in between there. And Does then, that make Saturday the practice day uh, coming from the Thursday game? Does that work? I mean, yeah, we'll find out, I mean, right? we'll find out. And yeah. I think that will be kind of the biggest challenge is to really, and every week it'll be a little bit different based yeah. on home or away. Um, but again, I think this group particularly that has a lot of experience, most of this uh, starting group has was playing and, and yeah. significant contributors in 2021 and, and have been around for a lot of them are fifth and sixth year yeah. uh, seniors. Yeah. And, and so we've tried to travel a lot non-conference um, to kind of get used to the you know, cross-country type uh, trips. And that's not easy by any means, and it will be a challenge. So I think that's something that will be part of our game plan is not just preparation for opponents, but how are we going to make sure that we're prepared for a quick turnaround off of a Monday game to a Thursday, and then obviously a preparation um, over the weekend for a Monday game. So. Yeah, it's going to be exciting. Yeah. We're going to go over that schedule here in a minute. <laughs> uh, but let, tell us there's been a rule change since last season, and, and maybe there hasn't, but but there were seven ties. You're 11-3 yeah. and three with seven me. ties. <laughs> and I know, you're, up I know you're not happy about that rule, but like, did it go away, or is it no, still here? No, it is unfortunately still here. We don't know. The coaches didn't, like, revolt? We, yeah, well, yeah, there's not much we can do. I, I don't think anyone really approved it. I think a lot of us were surprised that it passed. Yeah. 
Um, I don't think it's, I and personally so the, don't feel it's good for the game. And it, it, what, um, what did it do? It eliminated overtime? It eliminated uh, the golden goal or sudden victory uh, overtime. And obviously in soccer, you know, um, most people's complaint is there's not enough goal scoring. Yeah. Right. And, um, and typically that's something that we take a lot of pride in is that we we, t- we tend to play a very attacking style and, and like to score a lot of goals. And and last year, you know, sometimes it just didn't fall for us. And, and we know that had we had an extra 30 minutes, most of those games we were in pretty good control of the game. Sure. Um, we were out shooting our opponents. We had the momentum. Um, and so I, I think that impacted us. And it was a tough lesson uh, for us because – I don't think we've ever had more than two or three ties right, in a but season. But seven, and it was it's seven. not necessarily a negative, it's yeah, just the, the it's result kind of, of this negative. stat. <laughs> where, <laughs> where you got yeah. a team just going, oh, let's just hang on. Yeah. They don't even have to try to win. Let's just hang on to regulation. Yeah. We get out of Provo yep. with a tie, absolutely. which never happens. Yeah, absolutely. It, it totally changes our opponent's yeah. mindset, I think. doesn't necessarily change ours. Um, but, yeah, they can, they can sit back a little bit more. Um, yeah, and we had to we had to deal with a, a lot of the mental stress of that too. You yeah. know, the clock's winding down ten minutes, and it's a tie, and you know there's no overtime again. You know, I, I think that was a bit of a learning curve yeah. for us that hopefully we learned and, and can um, be better at it this this next you know year. Why, why do you think they they you know? You know, went through with that. Um, is it like a, like health reasons? Yeah, I mean, there's a significant study, sports science study, particularly in soccer, because it is such a world sport. There's so much science uh, behind training loads, and you know, soccer is not necessarily made to be a game. Um, you play within 48 hours mm-hmm. because of the rest that you need, and so I, I think that was a lot of it. Um, but I mean, we do we don't play too many games. Our our, our season is kind of crammed into two and a half months, which is a, a bit of a challenge. But um, it, it just really kind of evens out the field a little bit more. It, it's it's difficult for the NCAA tournament selection people to kind of decide: well, is it a good tie or a bad tie? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, it impacts RPI because yeah. there's not really a number that, that's really associated in that RPI. I mean, we had won a lot of games, and I think those ties felt like losses for us this last year. And I just had to. Keep Keep reminding our team where our RPI was because of our strength of schedule. We didn't have the mm. wins we were used yeah. to having, but because we had played such a strong, strong schedule, the ties didn't, you know, put us out of contention for rankings and, and some big and tournament. The tournament. But no, that, that was good. something that we kind of had to fight through the whole season because we weren't getting the, the results yeah. we wanted. So they felt almost as if like, it was a loss because we expected to win those well, games. It, well, I mean, as, as an athlete or as somebody as competitive, if I, if I didn't win, yeah. Hey, look, it's we a, saw. It's a, yeah. it's a, it's a, it's a loss. We yeah. saw plenty of the opponents celebrating like it was a win. Yeah, and that was hard that was, on South Field. I mean, yeah. to, to see Alabama, you know, they both Alabama and Arkansas, um, and they beat us. Uh, well, we tied Arkansas at South Field, but they celebrated yeah. like it was the biggest thing ever. Like and it was a win. Because it it to them, it was the it biggest was. thing. And, yeah. and the same thing happened to us in conference. You know, it cost us the conference championship. We. We figured that we, we, out of about 75, 80 shots, all we need to do is score one of those, and yeah. that would have Done solidified um, the conference championship because mm. of uh, some of those ties. BYU Sports Addict. By the way, we've got folks all over the world on our live stream no tonight. That's uh, awesome. From Australia, Singapore, you name it. Yeah, uh, World Cup. World Cup yes. stuff. So BYU Sports Addict writes, uh, BYU Women's Soccer is perhaps the best, if not one of the best programs at BYU. Seriously, spread the word and go watch their games. They're really fun to watch. Awesome. So you got some fans on here. Love uh, it. Let's talk about some of your stars. Sure. Brecken Mazingo is a senior. 13 goals last year, 10 mm-hmm. assists team leader in those two categories how vital is she for the big 12 she's extremely vital for us um you know brecken has really she had a kind of a breakout season this last year and and found her confidence and her rhythm and uh just such a a tough opponent to uh, match up against yeah. because she can beat you 1v1 um she has a, a really great cross she has a long range shot she can get in tight um, and so she's I, she's really hard for opponents to to kind of manage. And because of the unique system we play, we find her in gaps in spaces often. And um, she really took advantage of that last last year. And I think she's even. I just feel like she's going to even have more of a breakout season this really? year. Really, the- I'm super excited for Brecken. She looks great right now, so she's ready to roll. Olivia nice. Katoa yeah. used to be Olivia Wade. Yeah. Now she's at Katoa. She had nine goals last year. Yeah, you know, and and Liv's played three different key positions.
auditions for us during her career at BYU. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, she played kind of where Jamie's playing as a freshman when she came in. Then she went on a mission. Uh, when we played for the national championship, she was out wide, actually in Brecken's spot, oh, kind yeah. of where Brecken plays right now. And and last year, with with the graduation of Kayla and some other key players, lift, we moved her around a little bit. And it was the second half of the season once we got into conference play that we found her at that attacking center mid where Kayla played, and she really found her confidence in her rhythm. It's hard sometimes when you play different positions. I think in any sport, but typically the the number ten position in soccer is one. One of the toughest and um, a lot of pressure and every he's kind of the quarterback uh, you know the playmaker and she really settled into that spot really nice at the end of the season and and I think she's going to own it this year I, yeah, I was gonna, I was going to ask you that do you think players that play multiple positions um, do they you know within their development do they do you think that they end up having um, you know a, a better career versus somebody who you know, came in out the gates just one position. You know, I, I think I've seen it both ways. So I, th- I think it's kind of an individual thing. I've seen, you know, someone like Jamie Shepard came in and she played the six. She played that defensive center midfield her whole career and she's just gotten better and better and better at it. Where, you know, I think Liv, especially that position, she's had to play more of a defensive role, but then an attacking mm-hmm. role and then a playmaker role. And I feel like this coming year, she's really going to put it all together. So I've seen it uh, both ways where people have played some different positions and really excelled particularly that senior year where they've found that confidence uh, on the field and and kind of finding that spot that that really fits them is that when you as a coach to judge like yeah you know (laughs) coach gets to decide you gotta you know you gotta just focus on one thing yeah it's like a puzzle you know you you get your group and and every year it could be different based on the holes that you've got to fill from Mm. um, places uh seniors that you graduated or and um you know, I think it goes back to kind of recruiting, and we talk a lot about recruiting really versatile players that that can play any of the, the yeah. positions. You know, you've yeah. got someone right now like a, a Kendall Peterson who has started at the outside back for a couple of years, and, and even Liv Smith, neither of those girls played an outside back position um, during their youth career, but they're so versatile. they could. We needed them at that time, and then they've mm-hmm. just kind of taken over that slot back there. Shepard gave you seven goals last year. She's back as a senior. Yeah. And then Allie Fryer, a freshman, gave you a nine. She's back as a sophomore. How about those two? Yeah, well, J.B. Shepard, along with Liv, is, uh, there, t- there are two captains. Yeah. And um, I think the really growth that we saw from them last year is their ability to really lead the team. I mean, that's, that's, that's a big mantle to carry when you're used to someone else doing that. And I think uh, the experiences we had last year and, and through the off season is, have, have challenged them. Uh, so I think our leadership is as good as it's ever been with Liv and Jamie, and Jamie's a big part of that with the experience she has on the field and now the leadership that she feels, uh, you know, carrying the team a bit and, and feeling that pressure. I, yeah. I think she's good with that. And, you know, Allie Fryer had an amazing freshman year for us coming off the bench. Um, I think Allie's going to play a lot more minutes. Uh, I think she'll score a lot more goals. I think uh, her future is wide open right now. The girl is so fast, so strong, and has an amazing shot. So we'll see. Uh, it's, it's tough. She's going to come in with really high expectations. We'll see if she can manage those. But um, I, I, you know, our expectation is to score a lot more goals than we did last year. Do you, do you see the, the girls that maybe are naturally their their leaders from a from a team perspective like the team rallies around them they look at them but Mm -hmm. inside internally they're like oh i don't i don't want to be how does that impact it sounds like you know what you what you said is is you know with jamie she's more comfortable in that in that leadership role do you think there's an impact with you know on the field hey i don't want to be a leader but i just want to kind of do my thing yeah i think there's different the players like that i i I think it it can be learned Uh, i think they can grow into it but i also think um you know, you can't you can't have too many uh, kind of main captains, um, but I think we expect all of our our, our girls to lead at least lead by example yeah. and, and lead through support and that all in mentality. But um, you, you have to have some coaches on the field, especially in soccer, yeah. where there's no timeouts, there's no set plays necessarily, other than a few set pieces. You have to have those kind of coaches on the field that are holding their teammates accountable. And yeah. some some players aren't super comfortable with with uh, calling people out, yeah. you know, and holding people accountable. <laughs> and some accountable. people are a little too uh, some, eager to do some that. Some are a little bit more comfortable, I will say. <laughs> and I think that that's a big part of the leadership growth with Liv and Jamie uh, is feeling more comfortable yeah. in, in that. And, and they... they They've worked so hard and have been so successful, and they're such good friends with the girls on and off the field that they've earned that respect, and the girls girls will follow yeah. them. Yeah. 
So let's go to the net now. You got yeah. Savannah Mason, who's a junior, 21 starts in 21 games yeah. last year, 57 saves, 23 goals. You, you, so now you have, you've got experience all over the field. Now you've got a really experienced goalie. How, how important yeah. is that going into the unknown of a new conference? It's huge. I mean, you know, we just, I just got through talking to campers. I've been in camp mode, yeah. you know, for two months straight. And, uh, the, the, the goalkeeper is so vital. Uh, you can be a good team, but with a great keeper, you're going to win games. And you can be a great team, but if you only have an average keeper, you're not going to win as many. And so the, that goalkeeper position is so vital. Um, and, uh, you know, Savannah got such great experience last year. Yeah. It's tough tough to go in. You know, she hadn't seen a lot of action, and she'd been in our program three or four years. But that's how a lot of our keepers are. They kind of work hard. Um, kind of wait for their opportunity to kind of break through and and you know Sav started every game for us last year and uh, I think mostly built confidence um, you know it, it's hard going in when you haven't been in that's a, that's a lot of responsibility on a goalkeeper I don't know how those goalkeepers do it to be honest with you I don't know how they do it it's crazy it's, it's, a crazy it's position. like nothing going on until that it's all of a sudden tough, the game right I mean on. yeah one, one little mistake one bad angle one quick decision can can make a huge difference and so I've got some really great experience with some tough opponents and some unique situations with a lot of pressure uh, you can already see through our spring season and just with her back on the field right now and and uh, at camp I get to see him a lot. She's she's yeah. grown a lot. You got to have a, a short memory. I'm I'm assuming just like like a defensive a, back, yeah, like like a corner. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and you kind of I guess you got to have you have to have like a little swag too because sure. you know if I get beat for a touchdown and you know my opponent gets in my face and celebrates and says I suck. I'm you know through mm -hmm. that mentality I'm like no you you suck. Right. I don't care if you just score <laughs> you know a, a yeah. touchdown. So, so so much about a keeper is just a presence. Yeah, you know yeah. they might not touch the ball but just their presence on the field and just how they how they move the the their yeah. you know their body language yeah. you know you see that in football all the time that confidence can really bring a lot to the team. H how do you how do you recruit for that when you're in the living room <laughs> especially because we we know with 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 you know athletes they're on their on their best behavior right sure. you're seeing kind of like dating right you're yeah, seeing the yeah, best yeah. of everything so mm -hmm. how do you see that off the field obviously you could see that through you know watching film mm -hmm. you know high school but how do you see that in that personal interaction um, I think it's something that's learned too I mean I, I think that uh, being able to uh, just brush off you know mistakes mm -hmm. is, is a really tough thing and it's all about a mindset and uh, and I think that's something that keepers really have to, to learn more than, than others is it's so much easier I think to lose your confidence if you give up a goal than if you yeah. just made a bad pass so um, you know, I think that's something we work a lot on. Um, and I know Savannah spent a lot of time working on that mindset and learning how to, to, to kind of blow off some of the, the mistakes, but still know how valuable she is and important to the team, see, team success for her to just yeah. be there. Yeah. yeah. BYU soccer coach Jen Rockwood's on the Wise Guys tonight, live on YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, and wiseguys.com. Podcast will be up tomorrow. Uh, there are 10 players on your roster who've served missions for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Six of them returned this summer, meaning they put their soccer careers on pause for 18 months to teach the gospel around the world. What dynamic does that bring to your program? Because 10 is a lot. It is. You know, it's um, we're a very unique dynamic, uh, I think, uh, unique to all the other teams out there. Mm -hmm. um, usually because it's because we have more married kids on our team than most. Um, but now it's uh, the mission has has uh, been a big impact in our program. Um, I, I, to be honest with as a coach, it's, it's tough. It's yeah. tough to, to manage rosters and scholarships and positions and all of that because with the girls, you'd, you know, guys, sometimes you plan on that and, and girls will come up to you where they told you, no, I'm not going. And then two weeks later, it's like, I need to go. Like about 18 months ago, you had some <laughs> uh, surprises, right? I've had several surprises. Yeah. And then another surprise this summer, you know, with Haven, Savannah's younger sister uh, as a goalkeeper, leaving us with two mm. keepers for this fall, which we've never had. So you, you kind of have to just hope that it's all going to work out and, and support them. And uh, we've had great success with our return missionaries. We've never had six come back at the same time. So uh, we'll kind of work them into the program. And, you know, we have a lot of returning players we have a lot of young players but now we've kind of got this this these missionaries who are kind of young in their soccer career but a little bit older and a little bit more mature and yeah. um yeah it, it adds a really unique uh, really good dynamic and, and like i said we've had tremendous success with return missionaries on the field how many uh, foreign languages do you have out there Oh, I don't know. I mean, last year, Nat Well, she was our only senior. She spoke Mongolian. Yeah. How about that? Wow. Yeah. So, uh, so she's mad at you, frustrated. She can say <laughs> something in Mongolian. You're like, right. 
Yes, that's exactly right. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Abby, Abby was in Cape Verde, I think. So I think she spoke a, maybe a unique language there. Yeah. yeah. But uh, you know, Caroline um, was in Brazil, and we had some Spanish Portuguese speaking. Yeah. experience. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, that's cool. Football gets you know a, a lot of. Um, I almost said a, a word I shouldn't have used. I'm gonna keep it PG thirteen. Actually, yeah. I'm gonna keep it PG. Yeah, yeah. Fo- you know, you know, a lot of if um, you ever <laughs> if you ever say, wonder to yourself, should I say something? That is the red flag I, I, to I, say I, no. I, you should. I know it. I know it. When I stopped right there, it was like it was like a, it was like a false start on the line. Of That's why I, I paused and I remember. Okay, um, so so a lot of analysts around you know college football will always kind of give BYU excuse and they'll say, hey. Um, they went on a mission. They're 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 grown men versus playing against you know eighteen year olds and mm-hmm. they're mature, et cetera, et cetera. And they see it as an advantage. Obviously, mm-hmm. us being here, we know that it's it's less of an yeah. advantage. Do you do you get that same um, you know stereotype with within you know your soccer players? Um, I don't think as much, just because I don't think it's talked about probably as much as it's discussed uh, football. And, and again, um, you know, we usually only have a couple here and there. Um, it seems like in the last four or five years, it's been more of an impact in our, on our program. Um, but there, there's, there's really not a, a huge benefit athletically. Right, right. <laughs> I mean, there just can't be. I mean, mentally, of course, they're going to be a more mature person and have gone through a lot of tough experiences. And I, I think a lot of those challenges of a mission help them out athletically because we all know those of us that deal with athletes, it's tough. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of stress, a lot of pressure. There's injuries. There's just you know, so much uh, working out and sacrificing. Um, then you take a year and a half to two years off. That's a lot. <laughs> it's yeah. a lot of time. Um, and so, you know, I think it just makes them, you know, that much more hungry to get back and, and maybe work that much harder. So I think there's probably definitely pros and cons to it, but I don't see it as a advantage. Yes. Kalani likes to, uh, with the missionaries that come back, um, have them sit out the year mm-hmm. just to try and save their hamstring and, yeah. and all the injuries that seem to pop up with athletes that are hurrying back. But he's got 120 guys right. in his roster. Do you, you have that luxury or do they have to get right back in? Um, it, it's gonna, it, it's, it's kind of year to year, uh, kind of based on our situation. Yeah. I remember, you remember Rachel Bingham, mm-hmm. a little Bing, you know, she came back from a mission, um, and, uh, we didn't really need to try and push her back. We, we had some people that had some good experience in that. So we did red shirt when she came back and, and, uh, it ended up, you know, her advancing to that fifth year where she had such a great year right. uh, for us. Um, and so it's kind of a case by case scenario. Um, we haven't even made any final decisions yet on, on this group of freshmen coming in on, mm. on the red shirts. Uh, we'll just kind of see how it plays out, at least these first couple weeks. Yeah. The problem is we don't have a lot of time. Right. You know, I mean, yeah. we're playing a game like in almost a week from when we start. So, yeah. um, But uh, fun fact, we did have two missionaries come back and pass our fitness test, yeah. which is absolutely crazy. That's, right. Those are tremendous athletes. Yes. They can do that. <laughs> do they, do they usually not pass when they come back? Uh, no, it's a, it's a pretty rigorous fitness test. And, and, and they we, haven't been training. No, I, yeah, it's, wow. I, I'm, I'm amazed. I, I think they, they were able to get some workouts in on their mission towards right, the end. For them. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's talk about the schedule. We broke it down into three waves. Um, August 5th, the blue white scrimmage at Southfield. That's, that's, that's where folks are battling for, I don't want to be red shirted. I yes. want to play. So uh-huh. there's a lot on the line, yeah. but August 10th, you're at Rutgers mm-hmm. back East in an exhibition. Then you come all the way back here two days later for Idaho state. Is that when you referenced a moment ago of, of taking some country wide mm-hmm. trips to get ready for what's coming? Is that one of the, cause they're both exhibition games. Right. And, um, you know, I think we, last year we went to North Carolina. It's kind of fun. We started at North Carolina as an exhibition game and we actually ended there in the NCAA tournament. So it, I think, uh, it, it is a, an advantage for us to go out, especially for an exhibition game. Rutgers was in the final four with us yeah. a couple years ago. Uh, they have a lot of great returning players. So I think we'll know immediate, immediately kind of where we are, what we're working with. From the first game, I, this is the first year I've played two exhibition games. Right. Um, that being uh, the possibility of a tournament on the end, you know, we're only allowed 20 games um, in the regular season, and the exhibition count as t- uh, oh, towards do. those games. So, so, so you want to schedule? Yeah, schedule. so I've only I've only usually played one exhibition okay. uh, and then played 19 countable games. But with the opportunity for us to play in a conference tournament, we're going to get. Hopefully, you know, three, mm, three right. more games on top of that. So you see a lot of teams now playing two exhibition games. Um, 
but I just wanted to get another home game, and we were able to get Idaho State. So, uh, but yeah, the, the travel and the quick turnaround Little jet lag type is something thing to deal that with. we just are going to have to be dealing with all season. August seventeenth, St. Louis is the opener. Mm-hmm. Uh, at Southfield. Then you have Cal State Fullerton on the 19th, Long Beach State on the 24th. This is all next month, by the way. I know. Uh, <laughs> it's at Boise so State fast. on August 26th. Then you wrap up August with UCLA at Southfield, yeah. August 31st. How big will that one be? This huge defending national champions. Yeah. But can I mention that St. Yeah. Louis finished in the top 10 last year as our home opener? Really? So they were a top 10 program last year. And so we'll have two top 10 teams at home in the month of August. So, but yeah, the UCLA thing will be huge. I mean, uh, national champions. They beat, Place will be packed. They beat North Carolina, who knocked us out. Yeah. Um, I think it'll be packed. I think the freshman orientation will help when we get all those freshmen uh, packed in at yeah. Southfield. Um, so we're really, really looking forward to that. All right, Bilo, run through September. Okay, so September 2nd, you have Utah Valley, then at Utah, which is, that's pretty Tough. In- interesting yeah well from a mm-hmm. fan's perspective that's 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 fun yeah. uh tcu which is the big 12 opener utah state um at baylor at texas and then cincinnati that cincinnati game's the night before the big 12 football opener yes. against cincinnati so it's going to be a thursday friday into general conference weekend that'll be one of the great weekends yes. of the year but let's go back at your utah state game in logan on september 16th eight of your first nine games are in state and the one that's out of state is Boise, which isn't too far away. Nice job on the scheduling. Well, I do my best. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's <laughs> a challenge. I mean, we were up at uh, Utah State last year and ended up in one of those crazy ties that just felt like right. mm. we got punched in the gut again before we uh, started conference. Um, but just hanging around, how'd you get hanging around Utah? I mean, the, yeah. you're going to travel a bunch. We are. Uh, but you, don't, you didn't have to do it in September. Yeah, I mean, we we typically play Utah every year, you know. Um, yeah. We've been playing Utah State here and there. And then UVU, you know, they, they actually were one of the top RPI teams that got an... Um, and you beat and them in they, the tournament last year. they got an at-large year. bid. I right. mean, okay. that, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. Uh, so UVU is a very good program. They had their best season ever. So it's actually turned out to be a, a great RPI and actually a very challenging game for us. Uh, yes, yeah, I'm not calling them easy games, yeah. but they are local games, yes, which local. is good. Yeah, for sure. Well, and, I think Coach, um, Coach Pope is realizing that as well you know, on the basketball side. Too, yeah. Right? yeah, they're getting better. Yeah. yeah, and I think, I think too, that some people don't realize how tough, you know, unless you're kind of in coaching, how tough the in-state games are. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot riding on them, and especially for us, we're expected to win all of those games, and we usually know most, I usually know most of the rosters because a lot of them wanted to come to BYU. Yeah, sure. And, um, and so there's a, there's a lot on that line uh, every game, and we will always get their very best that, that's year why in and year the, out. It's that's, tough. That's, that's exactly yeah. why I said I was going to, I was going to mention that mm-hmm. is because, you know, those players are scorned, right? And, <laughs> and look, I got my scholarship taken away from me um, after I committed my whole sophomore year of junior college to San Diego State. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I came here, obviously it's, it worked out better, way better. Yeah. You wouldn't even be here tonight. I, I, right. wouldn't even, Look at you now. I wouldn't even went to a bowl game. You know? <laughs> That's true. Um, and, but, but going into that season, we, and, and we played Oklahoma. We played Florida State. I cared about none of those. Right. I didn't care about Utah. <laughs> I, said, I said to my guys, I said, I don't care if – we win zero games. I want to win two games yeah. in my career, which is San, San Diego, Diego State because I was scoring for. Yeah. Yes. So you got to. So with you and, and and well, you know, all the sports you have Utah State, yep. right? I don't know how it is maybe with, with Utah because they may feel that they're on the same level, but you know, definitely you know UVU now, right? Yeah, I would I would say you know we've definitely had the upper hand on Utah o- yeah. over the uh, years, and so. Uh, it is. There's, there's a lot of um, players who, and I have to remind my players. I'm uh, sure Kalani does too. There's a lot of, a lot of girls on the on the team that that would have liked to have been in their shoes, and they're not. And so they've got something to prove mm-hmm. to us coaches, uh, yeah. and to themselves. So those those in-state games, I think for all the sports. Uh, at BYU are, are more challenging, I think, than the fans realize. Hey, Les says, hello, Coach Rockwood from your Santa Fe, New Mexico friends. Nice, Santa Les, Fe. Les, good to have you with us. All right, let's go to October. You're at Iowa State October 2nd, Texas Tech October 5th, Kansas State October 9th, at Oklahoma State October 12th, and then at Oklahoma on the 16th. I don't know if you just stay back there the whole week because that's a lot of back and forth. And then Central Florida before the tournament, on October 23rd. That's a 
that's a tough October. Very tough. It's it's wild to hear those teams uh, yeah. Yeah, names in October. <laughs> it's, it's it's something none of us have ever had before. And uh, you know, as as a coach, I've played uh, most of the teams over my career, mm-hmm. but obviously our players haven't. Um, mm-hmm. And so I think they're really excited to uh, to go to some big name schools in college towns with phenomenal facilities. Um, and I think that's something that, that we can really look forward to. The, the newness of it all is, is really exciting. Our pleasure to have head coach Jen Rockwood on the Wise Guys tonight ahead of BYU soccer debut season in the Big 12. All the games that we just talked about will be on ESPN Plus, available to everybody. Might cost you a few bucks, but you can watch the game, which is access is still, you know, top priority. But Southfield... Um, the average attendance last year was 3,186. So I went over there to the Big 12 and started looking around. The uh, TCU led the Big 12 in attendance. Their average was 1,152. So more than <laughs> triple uh, at Southfield. Uh, and, and folks in the Rock I'll will, will want to hear not. this too. But how big of a home field advantage has Southfield become in your program? It's just, it's huge. It's huge. We, we're so fortunate to have phenomenal fans. Um, we, we're supported by the soccer community locally. We're supported c- certainly by the, the, fan, uh, the students and um, people of BYU, but uh, just a tremendous fan base. And we always tell the girls, you got to play great soccer and score a lot of goals if you want anybody to come watch them. Yeah. So, yeah. But uh, they definitely um, notice it. They know when there's... You know, not some standing room only, and they know when it's packed. And it's, it's such an advantage for us as I think we're number one in the country and have been one, two, or three, really, I mean, for 20-something years. So we, we've we always had such a great fan base on Southfield, and you can just feel the energy. I think it's one of the best places to watch and to be a part of a women's college soccer game. I'm curious, uh, and I agree, and I'm curious as these big 12 teams come, some for the first time, mm-hmm. to experience uh, one, whether they're going to talk about altitude and, and right. just like everyone does for the football stadium. But, but they come into Southfield and, um, and they're in the big 12. They've been in the big 12 for years, but that doesn't mean they have big crowds. Mm-hmm. And they roll out of the locker room to your stadium and it's full, and they're all cheering for the other team, right. your team. Uh, I, I'm curious just to see how they react to, wait a sec, we were the big time. Right. And we let you in, and we come to your place, and now we realize that actually in this sport, you're the big time. Yeah, and, and that's, that's, that's you know where we want to be. We want to be big time. And um, bringing those teams in, it, it gives us a lot more exposure than we've had. And the exposure we had nationally from just when we went to the WCC was huge. To be yeah. in, in a in conference with a, a Santa Clara and a Portland who had won national championships before and a Pepperdine and yeah. that sort of thing. And, and now just the name of the schools that we're going into, even though we, we hope to be the big dog, you know, we hope to be the main team. Right. Um, that That's our plan. Uh, we'll see. It will be more of a challenge, I think, than we face top to bottom before in any of the conferences we've been into. Uh, but I know this group of girls is really committed to to uh, you know playing some really good soccer and getting results. You know what I, I loved the most was um, going having away games, running out the locker room into the stadium and seeing that we had more fans yep. than you know uh, uh, the opponents. And and now granted they were like New Mexico State and Wyoming and, and New Mexico's you know especially UNLV. Um, and in soccer with, with, with you guys traveling, have you seen the, the same you know, kind of experience? We definitely have. I mean, obviously at a smaller level, but there's, there's no question. In fact, um, one of my favorite games, you know, you had asked me some oh, yeah, of my that's favorite coming games, here. right? Yeah. Well, one of those games was at University of Portland, and this is kind of back in their heyday. Uh, we had just entered the conference, and, and they could fit four or 5,000 people in their soccer uh-huh. stadium. And... Um, and they were ranked sixth in the country, and, and we walked in there, and um, we were used to kind of having that kind of fan base around us. But to go into their place mm-hmm. and beat them in front of their fans, uh, I bet we had over 1,000 uh, BYU fans nice. uh, that came to Portland uh, to watch mm-hmm. us play and cheer us on. And the Cougar I think, fans in the Portland they, area are awesome. I, yeah, I, I just, I, and I'm from Portland too, yeah. and uh, so that was probably a nice. super memorable yeah. experience for me. And uh, but uh, yeah, we get Cougar Nation shows up wherever we go, um, 
really exciting. The coaches and teams are always super confused. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, yeah. oh, they travel so but, well. And I'm like, well, we get a few parents that travel, but these are the rest neighbors. of them are here. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, before we yeah. get to your other four biggest games, uh, I do want to, and then we'll finish up with that, but you've got some coaching moves. Uh, Brent Anderson promoted to associate mm-hmm. head coach. He's been on your staff since 2017. Tasha Bell's a new assistant, comes over from Utah Valley, but coached at Minnesota, gives you a little P5 experience in that form. Those two are pretty important to you, aren't they? Yeah, I, I have an amazing staff. I, you know, I have more help than I've ever had. And, and, you know, Brent, you know, was at UVU for 11, 12 years, built that program. For, so for him coming over uh, mm. to help me at BYU was, was a big uh, – you know, very fortunate for me and yeah. for our program. And, and he's brought so much and just, you know, with everything that he's brought is obviously appropriate to, to give him that associate head coach title. And, you know, Steve Magleby has also been mm-hmm. with me um, for five or six years and, and they're just such experienced coaches. They could be head coaches anywhere. And so just fortunate that they've stayed around to hang out with us here at BYU. Yeah. And I, I know they love the team and they love everything about BYU. And then the NCAA just uh, changed the rules starting July 1st where volunteer coaches um, could now be paid. And so yeah. so we were fortunate our administration allowed us to bring on Tasha. She was, she's been at Minnesota when she's getting her PhD. And, and she's been at UVU as a goalkeeper coach for the last couple of years. So she was uh, excited to come um, back. She, she worked for Kalani for a little bit uh, in oh, football. Oh, if oh, you remember I, Tasha, I, yeah, you yeah, probably yeah. know Tasha. Yeah, do. do you, do. Do you yeah. have to be a goalie? Did you have to play goalie to get on your staff? Well, yeah, Cause, uh, because I see. certainly never have. And Brent was a goalie would. at Utah State, yes. right? And Tasha uh, was a goalie at Utah Valley. Yes. I don't know what Steve, I don't know what position. Nah, was Steve, he a goalie? Steve played lots of different positions. <laughs> he's, he's versatile like me. He'll okay. be the versatile field player. So, so you don't have to be a goalie the, no, to, no. to do that? No, Just but a coincidence. Our, our, our keepers are in good hands, so uh, we're excited about that. All right, let's finish with the uh, five best games. Uh, under under your administration. By the way, isn't it kind of cool to walk around and go, I'm the only coach? <laughs> it's just kind of weird, yeah. <laughs> it just goes it's so like, who fast. came before you? No one. I know. It's just me. It's wild. You see you see alumni coming back with kids. They're in college now, and yeah, it's it's wild, but yeah, my, my, it goes I, fast. I have two boys, 11 and 7, and um, I one of, one of my teammates, when I was a senior, he was a freshman, his son is 13. So we celebrated a birthday together and they did, you know, and it was a couple of our teammates there and nobody really recognized me with him because he's almost like my height. Right. So, um, it was, it was, it's, it's, it's just weird. And yeah. especially seeing all my teammates, you know, obviously are like six, five. So right, their right. kids at 11 years old, 12, 10 years old are already <laughs> taller than me. Uh-huh. So it's, it's a, it's a, it's a crazy feeling, but it's also a cool feeling to see like, this is the next you know, generation. Right. Have you, have you offered kids like that? Like, like Kalani has? <laughs> I, I have had a couple. Um, I think he's, yeah. I think he's reached down to the eighth grade. Yeah, he's like, yeah. yeah. And I think there might be a rule now that you can't. There but is. Thank goodness. Would you, ever, would you ever do that? And Gordon Eakin had a, an eighth grader who played catcher this year, but he offered when she was 14. I wrote a story about that. And I think there is a rule that says, okay. Like in their junior high, I don't think you can mess with them in junior high. Yeah, because we there used was some. To, you used to be able to recruit them when they were freshmen. I had some Reckon committed actually to us originally when she was a ninth grader, uh-huh. Liv Wade. So we've had to. Yeah. Uh, I know some eighth graders. I'd like on the team right now. <laughs> so. I won't say they're, names, they're but uh, I know who they are. So yeah, we got to keep an eye on those seventh and eighth yeah. graders early on. For sure. All right, so we we'll put the Portland game down on the list. The five best games under Coach Jen Rockwood, and we asked her to think about this coming in. Um, because she would know best. We, we, we study it all and all that, but a, a big game to us might not be one of the biggest games that you've had, and mm-hmm. you've played, coached so many, many of them. Yeah. So Portland's one. Let's go down mm-hmm. that. Let's list the others. So one, one that came to my mind was actually one that we didn't win, mm. but it was a huge game, uh, and the season was 20, 2012. We were a number one seed uh, going into the tournament, and uh, we had home field advantage, so we played our first three games at home, and then we uh, were able to host North Carolina um, in the Elite Eight. And um, that was a special game just because playing North Carolina. I mean, mm-hmm. I, when I was a young coach, I, would, I, w- I got my hands on every book and DVD that Anson Doran ever wrote yeah. or ever did or anything online. And, and so he was, he was an idol and an inspiration to me and just the history that UNC program had. And to have them on Southfield in yeah. the NCAA tournament, knowing that we were actually the higher seed. <laughs> um, and, and coming out to the field and the fans were already there. And you don't get that very much in women's soccer, but the fans were already in the stadium when we came out. 
And uh, that was just a really big time feeling. And we played a great match, but lost, ended up losing two to one. Crystal Dunn, who's actually been quite a star uh, on the women's national team, actually mm-hmm. scored the goal to beat us. Oh, really? Uh, uh, wow. That year in 2012. But that was a really special f- year for us, uh, even though. Uh, so I think it's one of the, there's only two games we've ever lost in the NCAA tournament that I wasn't really mad about afterwards. And uh, one was the loss to North Carolina, and then one was uh, the Florida State Florida loss State. to PKs. Cause is, that, is that because you, like, like the, the, the girls executed, you know, played almost perfect, and maybe, you know, just that day yeah. the opponent is better? Because mm-hmm. I'm okay with that as well. If, we, if I lose a game, and I executed, um, didn't make any mistakes. But the man, you know, um, across from me was just more talented physically. Uh-huh. I'm right. a, I could walk away. Yeah. But I can't. What I can't deal with is the mistakes, um, and not and, and knowing I didn't play my best. Was that right? Similar? And then I think these are the only two games I haven't been really mad about in my whole 400 and something games. Oh, wow, uh, okay. So the championship but, but yes, game was, it was something. exactly because of that. Because we were playing. I mean, North Carolina. They they they've won like 22 national it's championships. Like playing UCLA and John. Yeah, Wooden. and they ended up actually winning the national championship that year okay. yeah. too. And so you know you're playing the best of the best. And, and you played them respectfully. It was an amazing game in front of a packed stadium. Yeah. You know, yeah. we thought we had it a couple of times. I was off the bench celebrating, and it was cleared off the line. And then they went down and they scored. And then, and then yeah, Florida State was something super special. Again, yeah. playing the best of the best in the national championship game and, and knowing the level that our girls played at in yeah. that game. And, and um, what you had to do to get there. Exactly. And who you had to be. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. And, and that's how I kind of felt with both of those games because – we had to play two ACC teams going before we played North Carolina mm-hmm. at home and beat them at home. So, yeah, so yeah some, some, some special special memories for sure. Okay, uh, two more. Um, I would say um, our first run to the Elite Eight, um, we beat Villanova in PKs. And so that was at that time, that was back in 2003. That was the first time we kind of broke through the Sweet 16. We had mm. been to the Sweet 16, I think, a couple times prior to that. But in 2003, we kind of broke through uh, in a PK match at, at Villanova. Yes. And I remember thinking, wow, going to the Elite Eight. We're yeah. going to UConn for Thanksgiving weekend. And it was freezing cold oh, yes. and windy. Oh, miserable and back there. We didn't play very well, dang it, the first half. Played really well the second half, but couldn't catch the game. Yeah. So that was a, that was a special game too. Yeah. Okay, so we've got Portland beating them on the road. We got North Carolina at home. Villanova to reach the Elite Eight. Were we counting the Florida State game? Was that one of them? I, I think so. Can, so. I that, think you have to. Because it's a championship, you got to yeah. throw that one in. Yeah. And it was PKs, which which oh. meant that you went toe to toe, and then it's you know, and we saw it. Um, we see it in big time soccer. Uh, we're going to see it in the yeah. World Cup that's going on right now. It's. I guess left, they went right. That all it's, of a sudden, yeah. three hours is decided. I know. It's crazy. It's, it's just, it's frustrating for sure. Is and there a better way to do it? I don't know. They yeah. haven't come up with one in Because you've already done years, the two overtimes. So so somehow yeah, it's yeah. got to end. Yeah. yeah. You I can't think, have a tie in the I know. elimination it's, it's rounds. It's tough. And it's something that you don't really ever get to do during yeah. the regular season. So what if they did like a two, like a two on two? I know. Or, or, three or they three. used to do back in old MLS. I think they did like a one V one with the keeper with the person yeah. dribbling at yeah. the goalie. But I'll be, it, I'll it's be honest, hard. as a viewer, though, when yeah. it comes down to it's penalty kicks, you're right there. You're, uh, yeah. you're all in. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You're yeah. all in. So some of those girls in, in those PKs, Santa Clara and Florida State really hadn't taken a PK since like they were in high school. Oh, right. really? You know, because we just, you don't run into yeah. it very often right. uh, unless you're in the NCAA tournament. Yeah. And we won some and lost some in the NCAA tournament. It's a, it's a tough loss, but man, it's an exciting win. Yeah, for sure. For Did sure. the last World Cup, the men's World Cup, didn't it end in, a, in PKs? Wasn't it? Argentina? Yeah, wasn't it? Didn't it come yeah, down yeah, to yeah, that? Yeah, I think it Because we're just like, you yeah. two countries just... Yeah. On yeah. the edge. Well, the, and the NCAA tournament last year, too, did for the women, UCLA. Yeah, that's right. A couple of years ago, yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. Last one. One of the the last of the big five. Oh, I think. Um, let's see. I think. I think back in twenty. I, I looked it up. It's kind of fun going over the schedule yeah. and looking them up. And I think. I think it was early on, even before two thousand and three. I can't remember exactly. I think it was maybe nineteen ninety eight. We were in the tournament and we beat Stanford at home. And I remember it was lots of snow. I mean, there was snow. It was one of those where you had to push the snow off the field. And there was 
four feet uh, banks of snow along around Southfield, but the grass was as green as could be. And Stanford came in with these big, heavy things. They didn't know what hit them, and <laughs> we beat them six to one, and nice. it was just unbelievable. And then we went on to beat UCLA, and then ended up losing to Santa Clara uh, in the Sweet 16. So some really fun, memorable moments at playing at the highest level against some of the best teams in the country. That's great. Five best games in in coach's career right there um all right so uh you're going to get the team at practice next tuesday uh and as you you huddle them up there on the field is this the most talented roster you've had in what and you've had some super good teams but Mm -hmm. but where is this group compared I think it's one of the top. I, I don't know that it's the top. We've certainly yeah. had some talented players uh, over the years. Um, I would say this is probably also one of the most experienced groups that's mm. returning. You know, COVID did uh, a lot of harm and a lot of and a lot of frustration and, right. and all of that fighting through it. But because of COVID, these guys are all getting their extra bonus year, as yeah. we like to call it. And yeah. a lot of coaches didn't keep some some of those players around but we we kept everybody and gave them that extra year and it's nice. it's going to pay off for us i believe so we return all of our starters from last season so that rarely happens you know maybe you return Ever. six or seven but to return 11 Ever. you know that never happens and so again it puts a little pressure because our expectations right? through yeah. the roof right now yeah. um, but i think that there's a little bit of confidence and hopefully some swag because of how hard they've worked to get to this point, the sacrifices they've made, and just the experience they had. So I think the combination of, of talent, uh, experience, and leadership, and resiliency that they've learned over the last three years playing at a pretty high level, we hope that that will be a big benefit and a big factor for us. You know what's cool, too, is um, it's finally the Big 12 and all that stuff. And the very first Big 12 <laughs> game is your soccer team against yeah. TCU. So you get to lead the whole university into this new frontier. We're excited. Bring it on. Yeah. Last time we played TCU, they knocked us out of the tournament. So, uh, you know, got to get back yeah. at them. Yeah, that's Absolutely. right. And, and they, are the, they have been the best team in the Big 12 for the last couple of years, and we're a top 10 team last year. So right from the get-go, we're going to see what Big 12 soccer is all about. Well, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think, you know, us as, as athletes or just the athletic program and analyst fans wouldn't want any other program, you know, to lead <laughs> us off. You know. Well, appreciate that. This is, this, is the good, this is a really good year for us to be taking that step yeah. with, with the group that we have. It, uh, you know, hopefully we'll set a high bar for the future. We're glad you could break away from camp and come hang out with us. And <laughs> well, I appreciate you having uh, you, so, you told us you'd be back when we got the schedule, and uh, and we waited patiently, and, and, and it was great to get you a week before it all starts. So well, thanks. Thank you very much. Good luck this season, and, and we, we want you back whenever you want to send your players. We'll, yeah, we'll, we'll love uh, the opportunity to tell your story. So the great yeah. Jen Rockwood, thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. Thanks, appreciate coach. it, guys. Good luck. So it starts uh, Tuesday with practice, and then uh, – the blue-white game, chance for folks to get at Southfield and see a little bit of everybody. And then uh, and the big time kicks in. Uh, great to have the head soccer coach here. and.